In the previous video, we had shown how we derive the ideas of time dilation and length contraction. Now, this will allow us to then transition to something, and we can now have a more generalized way of talking about coordinates going from one coordinate system to another. So you might have a position and time coordinate in a one reference frame, and then you want to move to some other moving reference frame. How would we try to do that very broadly? Now, when I had wrote out these equations, I did leave one point that may need to be highlighted. When it comes to time, what I've actually measured here is not an actual time component, but in the work I had there, it was more true to say that I was looking at duration, a change in time. Basically, uh, we had looked and seen how long it takes a beam of light to go from one mirror to another, as measured in one reference frame to another, so we're looking at basically initial and final times. That sort of duration is what we are looking at. In the same sort of way then with length, well, length is basically about a change in x position. So you go from an initial x position to a final one, and that's what length is supposed to be. So really when we were doing these transformations, we were going from one position to another, from one time to another, and now we could try to use this to bridge then to a more broad transformation. So for comparison, if we were going to normally translate from one reference frame to another in just simply a position, I could say if I have some sort of velocity in the x direction, the way the position changes according to some other coordinate system is just I take what was my position in the inertial reference frame that's not moving, the one where everything is stationary, and then I am going to be subtracting the velocity the reference frame is moving, and then the amount of time that has expired. Why am I subtracting rather than, say, adding? Well, let's try drawing this out for a minute. Suppose I have two reference frames set up, one where I'm just standing in place, and one where I have a car moving away with some velocity v. So at this rest frame I can call s, and the one that's moving away from s we'll call s prime. And what our equation is supposed to be doing is taking some position in the uh, x spot and seeing what that position looks like in the other reference frame that's moving away. And with this sort of setup, we're also both assuming that they share the same sort of origin. So they both like agree on what is position zero, what is time zero. So let's say I am dropping some ball, and we know it's going to fall down, and it'll fall down at some position x. It'll just hit right here. While that's going on, though, of course, this vehicle is moving forward. So in that amount of time, the origin in this coordinate system has moved forward some amount. So you can imagine we have originally our coordinate O prime, and it has gone forward some different distance V times T, the amount of time it took uh, basically for that ball, say, to fall down. So our origin point here, origin prime, has moved forward, which in a sense is the same sort of thing as from the point of view of the car's reference frame is you're shooting backwards and the event is then and the ball is moving backward. So that's why we need to subtract this velocity here. From the moving reference frame point of view, going back, it's stationary, and we're the ones shooting back with some velocity v. So that's why we have a transformation like that. Now, what about the y and z? Well, there's no velocity in that dimension, so everything comes out the same, and we also agree on time. No issues there. Everything just gets a little bit more fun when we go to the cases where we have to take into account the effects of special relativity. Our new system is going to be a bit different. So if you were to just guess, you would think that maybe the simplest way of going about it is taking what was the original Galilean transformation, x prime equals x minus vt, and the new case then would just be the x position, and then just take what was 
how we normally transform between x prime and x and just multiply it by the gamma factor. And this actually happens to be the right way. I will try showing that a little bit later. The y and z transformations are going to be the same as long as the velocity is long in the x direction. These are not affected at all. Time, on the other hand, will not be so simple. In the Galilean transformation system, t prime and t were just the same thing. No issues there. Now, of course, we have to worry about the effects of time dilation. And that means we're going to end up getting something that looks like this, where gamma t minus v over c squared times position in the x direction. And so these are the Lorentz transformations. Doing the same sort of thing the Galilean transformations did of going from one reference frame to another where the two frames have some sort of difference in velocity v relative to each other. It is also worth, of course, pointing out if we wanted to go from the s prime frame to the s frame. So again, if our Galilean transformation was normally in this format, if instead of going from x to x prime, you want to go from x prime to x, well, you see that it's just one very simple algebra step or two, and you see it's just going to be x prime plus v times t. So we can follow the same sort of thing we did before, and we can get this form that x is equal to gamma factor x prime plus velocity times time. y and z, of course, again, are not interesting here. Time, on the other hand, of course, a bit more fun. Gamma times t prime plus v over c squared times x. So really you see that the difference between these expressions and the other ones where we are trying to go from the prime frame to the not prime frame versus to the regular frame to the prime frame is just a matter of changing some signs. Nice and easy, fortunately. Now, just to quickly show how it is we got that uh, time transformation, let's bring up again how we change our x positions between our two different reference frame systems. So we have x and x prime. And like I say, these are basically just derived by taking the Galilean transformations, multiplying by the gamma factor. If we want to see then how we go between t and t prime, let's just do one very simple thing. Let's look at this equation here and where we see x prime, well, let's plug in our equation for x prime. Let's just plug it straight right into there. So uh, x equal gamma, the quantity then is going to be gamma x minus gamma vt. And we also have the other uh, aspect from our equation right here, multiplying through with gammas. And ultimately, we want to solve here for t prime. So let's just do a little bit of algebra, setting that up. And if we're careful, we'll find that t prime is going to equal then 1 minus gamma squared times x divided by gamma times velocity plus gamma times regular t. Now, to simplify this, we'll have to do one little bit of trickery with our gamma factor. Since we know then that gamma is defined as 1 over the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared, if we take this uh, bit here and start breaking that out and then simplifying it, we'll see we have 1 minus 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if we do a common denominator, adding things together, we're going to find that that is going to be equivalent to minus v squared over c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. And then from our definition, we see that's just actually minus 
v squared over c squared times gamma squared. So from here, a little bit of uh, careful algebra, and we find this is what we can then plug in into here. And if we do that, things are going to simplify out, and I'm going to do just a couple steps of algebra to see what works out. We'll see that if we plug this in into here, um, a factor of gamma will go out, a factor of v will go out, we'll still have a minus sign there. We'll have one factor of gamma overall that's here, so I'll bring out that common factor, so everything works out to be v, that t prime is equal to gamma t minus v over c squared times x. And we could do a similar sort of work and figure out the how t and t prime relate to each other um, and depend on x prime rather than just x. Same sort of work all over again. With these Lorentz transformations, these two equations in particular, we see that there's also a really strange result that actually ends up popping out. No longer can you actually agree on two events being what we would normally say are simultaneous. How does simultaneity normally work? Well, that idea is, say, you're in your reference frame, and you could have two events going off at two different positions. We would say they are simultaneous if they go off both at the same time. So if you are standing in the middle here, and if you're not moving relative to these two events, let's say, um, two firecrackers going off. If you're standing at the midpoint, they both go off simultaneously, you would see the light arriving at you from both of them at the exact same moment. So they have different positions though, same time in our reference frame, but if we then want to see, okay, where do they take place in the new reference frame? So let's just say they both take place at time equals zero initially. One will have a position of, let's say, negative d. The other one will have position of positive d. And this will be our origin point here. So imagine we have some sort of spaceship zipping along, and it's at that same position at the midpoint, as seen by someone, when the fireworks go off. And we want to see, well, when do they think things happen? So let's do the time calculations. Well, t prime is going to then be gamma, and our ship, of course, is moving. t will be 0, so that part cancels out, but we're going to have negative v over c squared times position d, which is negative. The other one's going to have gamma minus v over c squared positive d. Now, of course, here we have two negative signs, so this time is going to be positive overall. This time is going to be negative. That should be very, very strange. First off, the two times aren't the same. And now it's saying that one of the events is taking place so many seconds before it was supposed to have been at time zero in the non-moving frame. So originally, this person would have said both went off at the same time. The person in the ship moving along is going to say the firework that went off in the negative x position went off before the one up front. That seems weird, doesn't it? If the ship were going in the opposite direction, then that ship would then say, this firework went off first and this one not. And there's all sorts of things we could do to continue to confuse this. This becomes even weirder, of course, if you're considering things like, say, causality. Two events are kind of simultaneous, or one happens instantly right after the other. Say, for example, I pull the trigger on a pistol, the bullet shoots out. Well, if the distance is separate enough, it could look like to somebody zipping along, instead of the two events being simultaneous, 
it could look like the bullet is fired and then the trigger is pulled. All this we're getting just from those two postulates that Einstein came up with and being very consistent with our reference frame transformations. This is how weird relativity can get.